Good morning. This is Pastor Dennis Roser. Welcome to Divine Service at St. John's Lutheran Church. The members of St. John's are committed to sharing the good news of Christ Jesus, who was crucified in the place of sinners, so that everyone who believes and trusts in him will not perish, but receive as a free gift everlasting life. St. John's is located at 1000 Bluff Street in Beloit. Our telephone number is 608-362-8595. Please visit our website at www.stjohnsbeloit.com. We are a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Our Sunday morning worship service is held every week at 9 o'clock a.m. And we invite you to join us and receive the gifts that God delights in giving you through His Son. Today's program is given to the glory of God by Bill and Tammy Bartz in celebration of their son Levi's birthday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who may heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, our support and defense in every need, Continue to preserve your church in safety. Govern her by your goodness and bless her with your peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from James chapter 3, verses 1-12. through 12. St. James writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire! And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, 
full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Together we confess our faith with the whole Church of Christ through the Church's Confession, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the name of Jesus, amen. This morning we continue our series on the epistle, the letter of St. James that we began last week. In a message on this passage, Timothy Keller, relatively prominent Presbyterian pastor in New York, says that, have you ever noticed that when you go to the doctor, he wants to look at your tongue because seeing what is on your tongue tells him a whole lot about what may be going on deep inside your body. In the same way, Keller reminds us, St. James appears to identify what is going on deep in our hearts, deep in our souls, by what is on our tongues, i.e., what we say, how we speak. As we look at this lesson this morning, James begins with an admonishment to anyone who would become a teacher, meaning a preacher, that those who are preachers will be held to a stricter standard, a stricter judgment, not only because those who are trained to preach ought to know better, but also because what we teach impacts the lives and indeed the eternal welfare of our hearers. And so after admonishing preachers, he goes on to speak in a very general way. He goes on to deal with every single one of us, regardless of our vocation. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Now we know that no one other than Christ is perfect. And so what James wants to underscore here, sort of drawing us in to think about these things, is that we all say things that we ought not to say, or say things in ways that they ought not to be said. As the sermon title says, our mouths runneth over. And we know this to be true. And if it were not true, then we would be perfect. But we know that we're not James says, if you're able to do this, if you're able to do this, you're able to bridle your whole body. Here he's speaking about your whole life. If you can control your tongue without error, without slip, well, then your whole life you could probably have a good grasp on. You can control. He says now he's going to give us two metaphors, two examples to teach us about how powerful, disproportionately powerful, the tongue is, being such a small part of our bodies, but it exercises so much control, so much power, gets us into so much trouble. He says, for example, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Think about it. A very large horse just towering over us but with a bit fitted into the bridle, you can turn that horse by his head and the body follows. In like manner, he says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Think of those very huge ships, sailing ships, and how the strong winds get behind them and just push those ships and yet, the pilot at the rudder guides that big ship in the midst of many storms wherever he wills. James says that's the way it is with the tongue. It's very small in proportion to the other parts of the body. But the influence, the impact that it has, unbelievable. Out of proportion with its size. Now he's going to give us a warning. He says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Forests being on fire are never a good thing. So we notice here that he is speaking clearly of the negative impact of our words, what we say. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small spark. And the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, 
setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. What he wants us to realize is that when we're not in control of the tongue, when we're not able to guard our words, what we say and how we say them, see, it's not only what we say, but the manner in which we speak that matters. When we're not in control, James says that's the devil who's controlling that tongue. And what a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. He says, for every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by humankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Jesus reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount that we not only murder with our hands and with weapons, we oftentimes murder the Spirit with what we say. He says, you have heard it written. You shall not murder. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother, whoever says, you fool, is liable to the fires of hell, we kill with our words. Sometimes, sometimes we don't even realize, aren't even aware of the destruction that is caused by our mouths. One of the things that has surprised me over the years, although it ceases to surprise me, is that as I serve as a steward in the church, exercising church discipline on behalf of the congregation, 90% or more of the conversations of calling people to repentance that have occurred in my office have regarded the sins of words, not all of the glamorous things that we think of when we think of sins, all those awful things that we gossip about. No, it has to do with the tearing down of others in the congregation with our mouths has been the chief cause of rebuke in the days of my ministry and perhaps of all pastors, because it is the easiest thing with which to get into trouble. It's always there and it's always on, ready to speak. James isn't kidding when he says it's full of poison. The things that we say that discredit other people, harm their reputations, things that we don't even really know what we are speaking about, yet we feel that we are an authority. Or maybe it is criticism. We tear people down. We make them feel small. One of the things as I have matured that I have come to realize that some of the biggest people, the most prominent people, are people who seem to never speak about anyone else, who always seem to have an encouraging word, building others up who are far inferior to them in whatever the subject is, but always encouraging. Because you see, they have arrived. They are what we see them to be. But those people who are not but want so desperately to be seen as something else and are clamoring up the ladder, for whatever reason, have an urgent need to tear other people down. And then there are those people who it seems that whenever we're with them, it only takes a moment or two when we find ourselves saying things that we really know we should not be saying. Or maybe we're those people who always have a negative outlook. And whatever the thing is, we have something dismal or negative to say, leading others into that trap. James says this can't be. This can't be for the Christian. Those who have come to believe that Christ Jesus has died in their place, answered for their sins, who bless God with their mouths, cannot also curse other people who they themselves 
are created in the very likeness of God himself. This is what St. John is getting at in his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, particularly in the first one, when he, when he says, how can you say that you love God and hate your brother? Because your brother or sister is created in God's own image. And so James says at verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. One of the things we didn't realize on the playground when I was a kid is that we understood what James was talking about. We used to say when someone would use bad language, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Maybe you've also heard that comment. We actually understood without realizing what we were understanding. That it is duplicitous to say that we love God, to thank Him, to praise Him. And then with that same member, the tongue, with that same mouth, to curse others, to gossip about them, to speak evil, to cuss or swear. He says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Of course not. And of course here James is picking up on Jesus' own words, who says, make the tree bad and the fruit will be bad. Because a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears good bad fruit. Never the other way around. He also says, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. You cannot go up to a body of water that is salt water and dig in your pail, no matter where you put the pail in, and pull out clean, fresh water. It will always be salt water because that's what it is at its root. As we look at this, it becomes very clear to us that as we looked through this passage and felt convicted, because if we're honest, our mouths do runneth over, mine included, many things of which I need to repent and have repented. That there is a tendency to say, okay, let me make a list a list of things that I need to do in order to improve upon this. Let me set out a course, a plan, for how I can change. Noble as it is, it will not work. The bad tree always bears bad fruit. The saltwater pond or ocean always bears salt water. What needs to happen, what needs to happen is death. Not our physical death, but a dying to self. Acknowledging exactly who we are as sinners. Acknowledging, claiming our sins, all of the awful things that we've said and done. Making apology to those whom we have offended. And dying to it. Dropping dead to the notion that we can clean ourselves up and that we are fixable because we are not. We simply lay our whole selves at the foot of the cross upon which in our baptism we were crucified. We were put to death with Christ Jesus. We are not redeemable by what we can offer. We are only redeemable by what Christ has offered once and for all upon the cross. His life in exchange for the death we deserve. And so all of that need to make ourselves seem as more than we are, we need to drop dead to that and learn humility. That need to feel important superior, is what brings about gossiping. The need to build ourselves up is what forces us to need to tear others down. When we die to that, seeking the humility that comes from Christ, the tongue 
ceases to pour forth the gossiping, the lies, the slander, the cruelty. For they are no longer driven from the heart. What does Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. James is right when he says, we have managed to tame all manner of beasts. You go to the circus, you see guys and gals leading around tigers and lions and elephants, huge and dangerous animals. But no one can con contain or tame the tongue. It's the heart. It's the heart that must be dealt with. The first part, James has already done for you. If you've been listening, or if I've been effective in speaking, that we have said all manner of things that we should have never said, should have never been uttered by those who confess Christ. And we stand condemned. The work that James has done is to cause a change in our hearts of repentance, of knowing that we have done wrong and seeking the forgiveness of God, the Almighty. Trusting in the promise of the gospel, you may believe because it is true, it is the word of God that Jesus was given to die for all of the things that you and I have said, all those words spoken, all of that cruelty that should have been repented of instead of poured out through the mouth. He has died for those things. They are washed away by His blood. They are forgotten. They are no more before your heavenly Father. You may need to make amends with your neighbor, but before your Father, they are gone. And so He calls you in humility to rise again to new life, the old self being put to death again and again every single day by repentance, to live anew in the freedom and joy of Christ who has forgiven you. And what you will find, as Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, out of the abundance of the joy that comes from knowing Christ and the forgiveness of your sins, come words of joy, joyful words, kind and loving words. You cannot tame the tongue. But when the heart is changed, the tongue will follow. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in praying the prayer taught by the Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening today, and may the gifts of God in Christ Jesus be granted to you by his gracious will. Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you, now and forever.